62-year-old Leon Francis was a husband, father, grandfather, and veteran of the United States Marines. He lived on Wind Drive in Newport News, Virginia, with his wife, Daphne, until his disappearance on the morning of January 14, 2020. Daphne would be the last person to see her husband before he went missing. At 5.30 that morning, she was sitting in her den, talking to her daughter over the phone when Leon came into the room, carrying an umbrella. He kissed his wife and said good morning as usual. When Daphne asked what he was doing with the umbrella, he responded, happy birthday, which was unusual, as it was not the birthday of anyone in their family. Daphne fell asleep on the couch after finishing her phone call. When she woke up at 7 a.m., Leon was nowhere to be found. He had left behind his glasses, identification, bank cards, and medication. A neighbor's security camera showed Leon walking, still with his umbrella, down a street one block south of Wind Drive at 6.49 a.m. The umbrella was later found behind a Wendy's, near the intersection of that road and Warwick Boulevard. Leon had been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in 2009 and had to take medication five times a day. His condition made it vital to locate him immediately so that he could be given his medications. It may also have contributed to why he seemed confused and left his home unexpectedly that morning. While Parkinson's disease is most well known for its physical symptoms like tremors, it can also lead to cognitive complications. An extensive search for Leon was launched. His family spoke to the local press and used social media to spread the word about his disappearance. They received an outpouring of support from the community, and volunteers organized their own searches and passed out flyers. On Sunday, February 16th, 2020, a man and a woman were taking a walk in Lee's Mill Historic Park on a path that took them along the Warwick River. They saw a man's body floating in the water, approximately 20 feet away from the shoreline, and called the police. When the authorities retrieved the man's body, he was wearing the same clothes Leon had last been seen in and had Leon's patient identification bracelet from a recent visit to the VA on his wrist. A vigil at a local middle school had previously been organized for that night by the community and Leon's family. The vigil was originally organized in honor of Leon's 63rd birthday, which had been three days earlier, and still went on as a night of prayer after the discovery of his body. The body found on February 16th was initially believed to be Leon based on his clothing and the patient ID bracelet. The state medical examiner's office was able to later confirm this identification using DNA, fingerprints, and dental records. According to the Newport News Police, the body had been in the water for some time. On March 13th, the medical examiner in Norfolk announced that Leon's cause of death was drowning with exposure to environmental cold. His death was ruled an accident. While the medical examiner was able to provide Leon's family with some answers, there are still lingering questions in the case, like what Leon was doing in that area and how he ended up in the water. Leon's body was found approximately a mile and a half away from his home. It is possible that he simply became disoriented and went in the wrong direction as he tried to walk back home. According to Leon's wife, Daphne, Leon's legs sometimes gave out from under him, and he occasionally needed help getting up, both as a result of his Parkinson's disease. If he accidentally went off the path towards the marshy area of the river, it is possible he could have stumbled and gotten stuck in the mud, but the scenario remains just a theory. Leon's family held services for him on February 27, 2020, where he was remembered by his friends, family members, and volunteers who had helped search for him. We're so grateful for all the efforts and the prayers and the time that people took away from their families to make us part of their life, Daphne Thomas Francis told the Daily Press. It's just amazing what people did together. On May 24, 2017, 27-year-old Zachary Wilkes left his home in Lompoc, California, en route to his aunt and uncle's home in Las Vegas, Nevada. From there, Zachary would be going with his uncle to Lake Powell to help him do work on a houseboat he owned. Zachary never arrived at his aunt and uncle's home, and no one in his family could reach him by cell phone. 
his brother reported him missing on May 26th. On October 25th, 2019, Zachary's black 1994 Honda Civic was found upside down in a culvert off of Highway 166, east of Soda Lake Road in Maricopa, California. Police believed that the car had been involved in a single vehicle accident and had not been located during the extensive searches made in 2017 because it had been hidden by dense brush off the side of the highway. However, Zachary's remains were not inside the vehicle, and there were no obvious signs of him nearby. On February 26, 2020, Zachary's mother, Elizabeth, announced in the Facebook group created to help in the search for her son that recent DNA tests had confirmed that Zachary had died at the site of the accident. Several days after his vehicle was located, one of the searches of the surrounding area had turned up two bone fragments. Tests would show that only one of them was human. Zachary's parents provided samples of their DNA to compare to the DNA from the other fragment. This testing would show that the bone fragment belonged to Zachary. With just this one small bone available for post-mortem examination, the cause and manner of Zachary's death could not formally be determined. We don't know how or exactly when he died. There will be a lot of assumptions, but no one knows, Elizabeth Wilkes said in her statement. As always, love and respect each other, she continued. Keep his memory alive in your hearts, and may he rest in peace, knowing he was loved. Shortly before 4 p.m. on January 17, 2020, Margaret Helen Becker left her home in Sebring, Florida to run some errands at the nearby Southgate Plaza shopping center. Surveillance footage would later show her inside the CVS pharmacy in the shopping center, where she filled some prescriptions. According to other people inside the store at the time, she appeared confused. She left the pharmacy at 4.48 p.m., and her whereabouts for the next 77 minutes were unknown. She entered the Publix grocery store in the shopping center at 6.05 and purchased some bananas. Surveillance footage from the grocery store shows her looking disoriented and unsteady on her feet. Helen left the Publix at 6.17 p.m. She never arrived home. Authorities attempted to trace her movements using her cell phone and the OnStar system installed in her blue 2018 Chevrolet Colorado, but were unsuccessful. They believed that activity at the nearby Avon Park Air Force bombing range may have interfered with the signals. The bombing range would later play an important part in the investigation. On the night of January 31st, Authorities learned that a blue Chevrolet Colorado had entered the bombing range without stopping at the guardhouse at approximately 7.30 p.m. on January 17th, the day Helen disappeared. According to the person who had been manning the guardhouse at that time, the vehicle had been driven by a woman matching Helen's description, and there was no one else inside of it. The range had no gate or physical barrier to prevent vehicles from driving onto its property. Based on this sighting, a search of the range was organized for the following morning. Several teams covered the various roads and trails throughout the range, and a dive team came in to search the Kissimmee River off of a boat ramp on the range. At 1.50 p.m., divers confirmed that there was a vehicle in the river approximately 30 yards away from the boat ramp. It was Helen's truck. It was still in drive, and three of its windows were rolled down. Helen's purse and cell phone were inside of the truck, but Helen was not. Divers would continue searching the water for her remains, but were unsuccessful. The formal search for Helen was called off on February 14th. Authorities are confident that there was no foul play involved in the case. Despite being in the water for so long, Helen's cell phone still worked after it was charged and the Highlands County Sheriff's Office was able to use it to fill in the timeline of Helen's movements on January 17th. It appears Helen spent the 77 minutes after she left CVS and before she entered Publix in the parking lot of the shopping center. After she left Publix, she began driving north on US 27. Instead of turning left onto one of the two roads that would have taken her back home, she instead turned right onto Sebring Parkway. She made several more right turns, which brought her to the bombing range 
and several more right turns after she was on the property that brought her to the boat ramp, which she appears to have driven off of, not realizing she was going into the water. Individuals with dementia are known to generally turn in the direction of their dominant hand when faced with a choice while they are in a confused state. Helen Becker was reportedly right-handed. While she has no documented history of dementia, some of her behavior on the day she went missing indicates that she may have been having cognitive difficulties, at least on that day. She appeared confused and unsteady while performing her usual errands, and authorities later learned that she had attempted to pay for her bananas at the Publix, using a bank card that she had previously reported as lost, before ultimately using cash to complete her transaction. The Highlands County Sheriff's Office is waiting on downloads of data from Helen's vehicle to see if they will provide any additional information, but they do not expect them to change the direction of the case or answer all of the questions in the case that may never be definitively addressed. This update has not been conclusively linked to a case previously featured on this channel, but since there is an appeal to the public for information involved in it, I have decided to include it in this video. In January of 2020, reporter Joseph Kohut of the Scranton Times Tribune received an anonymous letter. Your story made me realize that it is not too late to tell what I feel I should have reported to the state police or the Scranton police that night more than 30 years ago. The letter opened. It was signed, perhaps just a foolish old woman. The writer of the letter claimed that one night, more than 30 years ago, she had driven onto Interstate 81 North at the Musick entrance. While on the interstate, she heard a female scream. She then saw a fire and heard the screams intensify. After the screaming stopped, she could smell burning rubber and fuel. The other people in the car with her, including her husband, dismissed the incident as teenagers throwing a party in the woods off of the interstate, but she could not shake the feeling that the female she had heard screaming had been killed. However, she never reported the incident. Authorities do not believe that the letter's author is foolish, based on some of the details she provided in her letter. There was information in there that the time frame fit with other high-profile cases that had gone on in the same time, Scranton Police Captain Dennis Lukasiewicz told ABC 16 News. Based on some of the details relayed in the letter, the incident the letter describes may be tied to Frank Ossolani. Ossolani was convicted of the 1989 rape and murder of Renee Waddell. The burning body of the nine-year-old had been located along a private roadway. Ossolani is currently serving life in prison. While he has only ever been convicted in this one case, Ossolani is a suspect or person of interest in three other major unsolved cases in Scranton, which occurred between 1978 and 1987. I have previously featured one of these cases, the 1986 disappearance of Michelle Jolene Lakey. Jolene went missing on August 26, 1986, while walking to her home in Scranton after visiting her mother in the hospital. She may have gotten into a yellow car approximately a block away from her house. Scranton police are asking for the woman who sent the letter to come forward. There has been a lot of construction along the section of I-81 described in the letter, and they need more information from her in order to identify exactly where they need to search, and narrow down the timeline in order to determine if what she heard and saw that night could be tied to any of their open cases, including Jolene's. They want her to know that she does not need to be concerned about getting into trouble if she comes forward and faces no legal action for not reporting what she observed all those years ago.